welcome to our last series of lectures for our course on formal methods in philosophy. This time we're going to be talking about confirmation theory, especially about its history and its connection to the kind of Bayesian apparatus that we've been studying in the Teitelbaum book. Bayesianism is a distinctively subjective theory of confirmation with various attempts to try to make it more objective, but it begins from a completely subjective starting point. And as we'll see, the history of confirmation theory is opposed to this stance, hoping for something more objective. As I see the history of confirmation theory, it leads to Bayesianism in three stages. There's first the beginnings of interest in confirmation theory tied to probability theory in the stage from John Maynard Keynes to Carl Hempel. Then the second stage is Carnap's work in confirmation theory with the third stage involving ways in which the Carnapian project ends up having to turn more subjective to handle various problems with his initial ideas. So here's an outline of what we're going to do in these three lectures. I'll begin with some introductory remarks. We'll spend time on the first stage, the second stage, and then the third stage, which leads to a kind of subjective Bayesianism, the sort that we've been studying in the Teitelbaum book. So what have we been thinking about so far? So far, we have a Bayesian apparatus focusing on mental states of a certain sort, call them credences and some parameters, that's a misspelled word, isn't it? Parameters in place for when a collection of mental states is rational and when changes in one's total view are made rationally. It would be an advantage for Bayesianism if this same apparatus could be applied in other areas as well. For example, to theories of rational decision-making or to a theory of confirmation that's central to any proper understanding of the status of science. The history of confirmation theory inclines toward pessimism here, though, since that history focuses on the need for a logical and objective notion. That's in quotes because it's an often repeated phrase characterizing the notion of confirmation that was being sought. And Bayesianism here appears to be way too subjective. As we'll see, however, the story isn't quite that simple. Perhaps a way to read the history is to see it as showing that Bayesianism gets as close as one can to the ideal that we wanted to have an intellectually respectable notion of confirmation for purposes of understanding the status of science. So confirmation theory begins in the early part of the 20th century after the work of Frege and Russell and early Wittgenstein in formal logic. It's important to understand here that early work in the 20th century partakes of an intellectual disposition that's cultural and broadly cultural in favor of precision in science, mathematics, and other places. This is what motivated Frege to begin his work on logic was the sad and sorry state of the foundations of mathematics. So he tried to clean that up and tried to make everything much more precise and was immensely successful and influential because of it. In fact, we have current computer architecture as a result of his early work in the foundations of mathematics. The same sort of effort on behalf of precision showed up in the work of later people that followed in the Fragian tradition, Russell, Wittgenstein, and especially in the Vienna Circle and people working at Cambridge in the 1920s. The worry was that science wasn't adequately respected, and the way to make it respectable was in part demanding a kind of precision and careful work that hadn't been done to this point. We can trace this effort at precision and careful work all the way back to Comte in the 20th, in the 19th century, early 19th century. But the history of this is something that's better covered in the History of Analytic Philosophy course. So I'm not going to say much more about it except to say that the important worries in the 1920s were that 
certain notions, key notions for understanding science might not be coherent. One was the notion of truth, and this was threatened by various paradoxes about truth. The other was the notion of confirmation. Confirmation seemed to have the kind of status that ethical requirements had, at least on its face. It looks like a piece of information confirms another piece of information when, if you know about the first, you ought to believe the second. Call this the normative understanding of confirmation. If confirmation is just normative at its core, this would undermine a kind of objectivity that we might hope for in science. That objectivity is supposed to be a matter of descriptive and mathematical facts, not a matter of moral judgments, ethical demands, normative requirements on what you should believe given what else you believe. This was heightened as a result of the work in the Vienna Circle, where ethical demands were claimed to have no intellectual, no cognitive significance of any sort whatsoever. They were literally nonsense sentences. The task was to find out why they were important sentences in spite of having no cognitive content. So if it turned out the theory of confirmation reduced to normative sentences, those sentences would lack cognitive significance and there would be no hope that the notion of confirmation in the history of science, in our understanding of the nature of science, could be objective in any interesting sense at all. So the early task was to see, can we avoid this normative conception of confirmation? Can we make sense of confirmation in a way that makes it, sometimes the word was objective, sometimes it was logical. Typically, they were put together. We're looking for an objective and logical notion of probability. So we start out confirmation theory at the beginning with a couple of distinctions. First, let's distinguish between quantitative and qualitative confirmation. The latter is digital, the former is analog. So quantitative is measurable in terms of discrete units. Qualitative confirmation is just a more or less matter with no precise numerical units being attached to it. We also want to distinguish comparative from non-comparative confirmation where the former tells us that a piece of evidence confirms one hypothesis more than another, and the latter tells us that one hypothesis is confirmed. On the former distinction, if we're talking about qualitative confirmation, what we're looking for is something that falls in the three categories of neutral, positive confirmation, negative confirmation. So you've got a piece of information. You get qualitative confirmation, judgments when you say that piece of information is neutral with respect to this hypothesis, positively confirming with respect to the hypothesis, negatively disconfirming with respect to the hypothesis. The quantitative measure would have to rely on this as a beginning mm -hmm. point, but it becomes much more detailed, much more fine-grained. If you have two pieces of information, both of which confirm a hypothesis, can we measure the degree to which one of those confirms it more than the other? For that, we'd need a quantitative notion. Finally, we distinguish between gradational and non-gradational confirmation. The former tells us that there's some evidence in favor of a hypothesis. The latter tells us that the hypothesis has been shown to be true full stop. We can also identify this distinction in terms of absolute versus incremental confirmation. So suppose you have 17 different tests of a given hypothesis. For each of those tests, you can record whether the result of the experiment counts for, against, or is neutral with respect to the hypothesis. Now you have 17 individual different accounts of a non-comparative judgment concerning the relation between evidence and hypothesis. But we also want to know full stop whether the hypothesis is confirmed by the totality of the tests. For that, we need a notion of absolute rather than just incremental confirmation.
Notice here, incremental confirmation can be either quantitative or qualitative. The question is whether we're looking at an atomistic versus a holistic account of the evidence that we've got with respect to the hypothesis in question. Now, given those distinctions, we have a number of tasks that any theory of confirmation would need to address. And we can begin the project of finding a theory to explain all of this with the pioneering work of confirmation by Carl Hempel, his most important work is published in 1945, Carnap's in 1962. And the source of all of this traces all the way to John Maynard Keynes' 1921 book, A Treatise on Probability. This is the same Keynes, by the way, who's famous in economic theory for a Keynesian account. So let's talk about the first stage. The first stage is highlighted by a desire for linking up what we want in the theory of confirmation with the kind of thing that we got from Frege in logic. So Keynes wants what he calls a logical and objective notion of probability. Compare this to what Frege was trying to do in the foundations of mathematics. Frege was worried that the notions of proof and semantic validity and that sort of thing that you were getting from mathematicians was mysterious to an unacceptable degree. What was his solution? Try to reduce mathematics to logic. That project sort of succeeds, ultimately fails, but that's the idea. So when Keynes wants a logical and objective notion of probability, the reference here to logic is supposed to remind us of his intellectual heritage, which traces to Frege. You're going to try to do, in some way or another, you're going to try to reduce confirmation theory to logic in some way or other. So an early way of connecting Keynes idea with the Fregean tradition is to think of confirmation as the inverse of entailment. That when a hypothesis entails a bit of information, that information confirms the hypothesis in question. Some people, me for example, have called this the high school understanding of confirmation theory. An early version of this approach is the hypothetical deductivism in Ayer's 1936 language, Truth and Logic. So here's Ayer's theory, the hypothetical deductive confirmation theory. A confirmation relation between E and H holds if and only if there are true auxiliary hypotheses that don't entail E but do entail E in conjunction with H, without also entailing not H. So the latter parenthetical is to make sure that we have consistency here. But notice the relation between confirmation and entailment. You get entailment in one direction, giving rise to confirmation in the inverse relate, um, direction. So if E entails H, we're well on our way to deciding that H confirms E, or to stick with the symbols that I'm actually using here. If H entails E, then E can confirm H. Now, it's not just enough to have this entailment. We have to have some other things going on. So we have to have a role for auxiliary hypotheses, for example. And we don't want those auxiliary hypotheses themselves to do the entailing. We want the entailment to depend on H. Why this role for auxiliary hypotheses? Well, the bottom line is no theoretical hypothesis ever entails anything about the observational level by itself. So one of my favorite episodes in the history of science is Lavoisier's experiments in favor of the oxygen theory of combustion over the phlogiston theory that was actually the common sense view at the time. So he set up various experiments and you're supposed to see certain observational results. But when you set up the experiment, you've got all sorts of information available to you about the apparatus that you're using, how you set it up, how you generated the prediction that you're supposed to get. But in any case, it's pretty clear that the hypothesis that oxygen causes combustion won't 
entail the experimental evidence that you got all by itself. You're going to need some story about how the experiment was designed and what the assumptions are that were being made in the process of setting up the experiment. But the idea here is we can understand the notion of what a hypothesis predicts in terms of the logical notion of entailment. That's a claim that deserves scrutiny. As we'll see as we move forward, perhaps that's completely the wrong way to think about what it is for a theory or a hypothesis to predict a bit of evidence. Maybe prediction here is an epistemic notion rather than a logical one. It has to do with the theory of rational belief or something like that, so that confirmation is the inverse of prediction, but prediction is not rightly understood in terms of the notion of entailment. That's something to keep in mind. In addition, you might want to pause the video for a moment and look at this confirmation theory and see if you can figure out counterexamples to it. They abound. Some of them are historically important, but they abound. So think about it for a moment. I'm not going to talk much about that except for the historically important ones, but it's an interesting project to take a claim and practice your counterexample skills, and this is one of those. So here's some examples. Suppose you see a bunch of black ravens, and suppose you suitably controlled for bias in your sample. So you didn't just look at Forest Park black ravens. That's clearly not the only place in the world that black ravens, that ravens are to be found. But in any case, you look at a bunch of ravens and it turns out all of them are black. That confirms that all ravens are black because the latter entails the former all on its own. So let the set of auxiliary hypotheses be the empty set. There are true auxiliary hypotheses that don't entail E. So they can't do all of the work, but they do entail E in conjunction with H. So this you might think of as a limiting case for the role of auxiliary hypotheses. You get the entailment relation, and then you get to say the sample confirms the generalization because of the entailment. What about reading on a digital thermometer? A reading of 72 confirming that it's 72 degrees in the room that you're in right now. Here we need auxiliary hypotheses. Any idea of what you're going to include? Presumably something about the design and function of the thermometer and that sort of thing. Note that this theory of confirmation can only be a theory of incremental confirmation, but not in a way that's quantitative. Entailment is an on-off switch, so if you're reading a notion of confirmation off of an on-off switch, all you're going to get is a theory of that there's some degree of confirmation going in the opposite direction of the entailment, but the measure of it, you'll have no idea how to do that. HD confirmation also doesn't help much with statistical hypotheses, such as the claim that most Missourians voted for Trump will vote for Trump in the next election. Assume I did this before November 4th. I don't, I don't honestly believe uh, Trump's going to run again in 2024, but who knows? And if he did, probably most Missourians would vote for him again. Note also that the auxiliary hypotheses are strangely independent of our knowledge or awareness. All that's required on Ayer's theory is that they're true. But shouldn't confirmation depend on whether we have evidence about these truths or know that they're true, not merely whether they are true? Here's a good example. Think of seeing the pyramids and the hypothesis that they were built by aliens, a hypothesis notoriously defended in the book Chariots of the Gods. It's not hard to imagine auxiliary hypotheses that satisfies Ayer's HD theory, and these hypotheses might be true, in some sense of might at least. But the auxiliaries are ones that we have no reason to believe, perhaps plenty of reason to disbelieve. So even if they're true, 
should we really be getting confirmation of the alien hypotheses just from hypothesis just from looking at the pyramids? It looks like the answer is no. You look at the pyramids, is that evidence that they were built by aliens? No, it's evidence that it was a monumental architectural and engineering feat that uh, occurred here, but the stuff about aliens isn't confirmed at all. Here's also something really interesting. Now, I'm going to just uh, go through this very quick, but this comes from I.J. Good. As many of you will know, Alan Turing was crucial in breaking the Enigma Code of the Nazis in World War II, and one of the most important people that he hired was I.J. Good, who, who had just finished a PhD in mathematics, and he worked with Turing on breaking the Enigma Code. So here's a picture of an Enigma machine. So as you'll see, it has a keyboard. So if you're sending a coded thing, there's a keyboard, and the keyboard is linked to some lights that flash on and off that generate the code in question. But all of this is made to work by an initial setting of the machine. So the coded message would be different depending on what the initial setting was of the machine. The machines were well understood. And so each day, if you're going to send a new message, you'd try to pick a different setting to make it harder to de decode the message. So the messages were able to be decoded already by the intelligence people in Great Britain. The problem was they couldn't do it very fast. So suppose you have a message and it takes you 11 days to decode it. Well, the message might be about a submarine attack that was going to occur the next day, and then your decoding process is too late. So Good and Turing relied on Bayesian reasoning to try to calculate what this initial setting was given what they knew about previous messages and that sort of thing. And it turns out they were very successful at this. It's an amazing accomplishment and turned the tide in World War II. So I.J. Good is part of the Bayesian crowd that say, look, whether or not you've got confirmation between a piece of evidence and a hypothesis, you're treating that, A.J. Ayer, as a two-place relation between E and H. It's not. It's a three-place relation between E, H, and background information. So when you give the Raven example that I used first to I.J. Good, he says, look, the most important thing about this is to consider what else you know in terms of background conditions. He says, here are five different possible background contexts. Suppose you know that one of these five is true. So the first one is either 950 birds are ravens, but only 949 of them are black, or 10 birds are ravens and all are black. That's a piece of background information that you might already know to be true. Second one, 998 birds are black ravens. At least one of the other two is white, but it's unknown whether either is a raven. Third piece of information, 900 birds are black ravens. All others are white, but it's unknown whether any of the others are ravens. Fourth, there are 990 ravens, 980 already known to be black. Of the 20 remaining birds, either 10 are black ravens and 10 are white doves, or all are ravens equally likely to be black or white. And the fifth possible background context, there are at most 50 ravens. 10 ravens have been found to be black. The rest of the population is heterogeneous with respect to color. Now he does this because he says, look, whether or not your sample confirms that all ravens are black depends on the context. In the first context, seeing a black raven lowers the probability of H. Seeing a non-black non-raven raises it. In the second context, both raise it. In the third context, seeing a black raven is irrelevant, but seeing a non-black non-raven raises it. In four, seeing a black raven raises it, and seeing a non-black raven lowers it. 
but a white non-raven raises it to the probability of one. In the fifth, both sightings raise it. Now you can see what he's doing. He, you can see remnants of this desire to retrodict what's going on in the Enigma machine. But the relevance of background context, what you already know to be true, was absolutely essential in solving the Enigma code. Because you had to already know something about previous decodings done by the intelligence community, because that gave you the background context to try to predict what the initial setting was for the message you were currently looking at. That turned out to be absolutely essential to the work that they were doing. So they became convinced, I.J. Good defended this his entire life, background context matters. And so whether you get confirmation or disconfirmation from a piece of information isn't just a two-place relation between that piece of information and the hypothesis. It's a three-place relation. So the A.J. Ayer account is completely undermined by this requirement that it be a three-place relation, not a two-place relation. In any case, that's the initial background context for the first stage, leading up to the work of Carl Hempel. That background context was, we want a logical and objective notion of probability, confirmation, and we get that by connecting the notion of confirmation to the notion of probability. So how does Hempel fit into this? Hempel shares the vision of a logic of confirmation that's analogous to Frege's accomplishments regarding deductive logic. His idea was that a logic of confirmation would arise in three stages. First, we get a grip on the qualitative dimension, whether a piece of information is neutral, positive, or negative with respect to a hypothesis. Then we move from that to comparative, where we get to say we've got two pieces of information does one of them confirm the hypothesis more than the other? That's the comparative stage. And then finally, we end up getting to the quantitative stage, stage where we can attach a precise degree of measure on how much confirmation is generated by a piece of information for a hypothesis. The problem is Hempel got stuck at stage one. This is one of the most important episodes in the history of confirmation theory in the 20th century. What happened at stage one in Hempel's account of how to get a qualitative notion of confirmation? He began with what he claimed were plausible conditions on qualitative confirmation and showed that they generate a paradox. The first one was the entailment condition. Now this isn't A.J. Ayer's entailment condition. This is a different one. This says if E entails H, then E confirms H. Perhaps you want to say, as I would want to say, look, that's, that understates things. If E entails H, then E provides the maximal amount of confirmation anything could provide for H. I mean, entailment is the best thing there could ever be in terms of having evidence. In any case, that's the first of his three conditions, entailment condition. So as you're looking at these, ask yourself, do these look plausible? Is there anything that might lead you to deny them? Because things are going to blow up. So the entailment condition. That one looks fairly secure. If you have grounds for concern about it, I'd love to talk to you in office hours about it to hear what you're thinking. Second condition, the equivalence condition. Suppose two hypotheses are logically equivalent with each other. H, if and only if, H prime. And suppose that E confirms the first of these. If both of those claims are true, Hempel said, then E confirms the second as well. And notice you could switch this around. You could switch the H prime and the H around because it doesn't matter which direction you're going. The equivalence condition says for logically equivalent propositions, confirmation for one gives you confirmation for the other. The third condition is called Nikod's condition. It says generalizations are confirmed by their instances. So if you've got for all x, fx arrow gx, 
a statement of the form A is F and A is G provides a tiny bit of confirmation. The idea behind this condition is we know that if we get a large enough sample, all of which have a uniform characterization, the generalization is supported by a large sample, how could that be if each of the instances don't provide a small amount in their favor? The idea is when you get a large enough sample that's properly constructed, you get confirmation, maybe absolute confirmation, and the way it arises is each of the instances gives you a little bit, and if you get a large enough collection of little bits, you get full confirmation. So, in symbols, the confirmation relation C holds between F, A, and G, A, and all Fs or Gs. Here's where things blow up. It's the Ravens paradox. So, first point, all Ravens are black is logically equivalent to all things non-black are non-Ravens. Notice that's just transposition inside a universal quantifier context. A white piece of chalk is a non-black, non-raven. So a white piece of chalk confirms that all non-black things are non-ravens, because it's an instance of that generalization. And by the equivalence condition, it thereby also confirms that all ravens are black. But being shown a white piece of chalk or anything else that's a non-black, non-raven isn't evidence that all ravens are black. Why should you think that? Well, imagine trying to confirm that all ravens are black. Just go up to the copy machine in any of the offices in the university, and usually there's a big box of paper sitting there. Each ream of paper has, what, 500 sheets of paper in it? And probably the box has, I don't know, maybe 20 reams? Suppose that's true. Then each of those big boxes, 20 times 500, gets you 10,000. Okay, so you want to confirm that all ravens are black? Start opening up the packages and leafing through each of the reams of paper. Each time you look at another white sheet of paper, you're confirming a little bit that all ravens are black. And by the time you're done with 10,000 of these things, gosh, you've got a really big sam sample. That's a huge sample. So it looks like the way to stop it is to say, no, that's not evidence. A white piece of chalk just isn't evidence at all. So that's the paradox. Now, Hempel, Hempel's own view was you have to bite the bullet and say that the white piece of chalk or the white piece of paper does confirm. But he didn't have any good story as to how that solved a problem. Other people said Nikod's condition has to be limited. It's true only, Quine said, for natural kind predic predicates. Natural kinds are things like tigers, lions, human beings, oak trees, that sort of thing. And non-ravens isn't a natural kind. It's just an agglomeration of a whole bunch of things, some of which are natural kinds and some of which are uh, not natural kinds either. So table isn't a natural kind, by the way. It's an artifact, so artifacts aren't natural kinds. So non-ravens would include tables. That's not a natural kind. It would also include being an oak tree or an armadillo, that disjunctive kind, and that disjunctive kind is also not a natural kind. Hempel's view was you have to embrace the conclusion in order to make sure that confirmation isn't relative to background knowledge. That was his view. His big worry was that I.J. Good and company were going to win this debate about confirmation, and the only way to stop them from winning, to make sure the confirmation was a two-place relation, was to embrace the conclusion. So he saw a threat from the paradox to his two-place relation account of confirmation. And notice why somebody in the Keynesian tradition here would want a two-place relation. So you're thinking about these two symbols that we studied in logic. 
that each of those symbols indicates a relation, and it's a two-place relation between premises and conclusion. So if you're thinking confirmation theory ought to look like logic, you're thinking, well, we can't, we can't use the same symbols, so let's use squiggly lines. This is, in fact, some standard notation in certain non-monotonic logics. But the idea is we want this symbol to be analogous to this, and we want this symbol to be analogous to this. So those symbols have to indicate a two-place relation as well. And if we don't have that, we're simply not going to have a logical notion of probability. So I think that's what underlies Hempel's insistence. Uh, nope, there's nothing. There's nothing to do here except bite the bullet. A different approach relativizes. It says any notion of confirmation in interest of interest in science or ordinary life has to be sensitive to background knowledge. So Nicode's condition would be suspect relative to some background context is fine, relative to others it's not fine. So if you go back to that slide that preceded the picture of the Enigma code, the point of I.J. Good's five background contexts is precisely this notion of relativization. Confirmation is simply not a relation between evidence and hypotheses alone. It is instead at least a three-place relation between evidence, background information, and a hypothesis. That brings us to the end of stage one of our inquiry. So I'm going to stop this video and we'll pick up the next time with stage two, which is when Rudolf Carnap enters the story.